Heavenly Father, Lord, I need you in the preaching of this word. I need the touch from heaven. I need your spirit. I need your presence. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Lord, I confess I cannot do this without you. I plead your precious blood over me and I ask you to lead and guide my heart, my mind and my thoughts at this moment. Lord, let me not miss one point that you have for me this morning, but let me bring the word that you've laid on my heart to bring this morning. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, I'd like to begin with a, a story, if I may. Um, in the story, we see a cold winter's evening. And in that cold winter's evening, we see that there is a, a man, and this man is walking through the streets. And as a man is walking through the streets, a young man, um, on his way home, on a winter's evening, he comes across a big house and as he comes closer to this big house he sees that there's something happening inside of this house there's a commotion there's something going on in this house and the closer he gets the more he sees that the commotion is not something good but something bad and he sees that there's a fire that's raging in this house and as he comes around the corner of this house where the fire is raging he sees a mother and a father holding hands and weeping and he hears a a fire department say to the mother and father, listen, the house is too engulfed, we can't get in there. And he hears the mother screaming, but my little daughter is upstairs. And the fire department is refusing to enter, and she's crying, and the house is burning. And um, we see a young man forget about himself, and he runs into a burning house to save a little girl in the second floor bedroom. While he enters the house... The fire rages around him and the fire burns his feet. And as he goes up the barrister, the fire burns his hands. As he opens up the doors, the fire burns his hands and the fire burns his feet. And as he runs into the room where the little girl is, he takes the blanket and throws it over her and grabs her in his arms. And he runs down the stairs and while he's going down the stairs, the fire is around him and the, the fire burns his back. And the fire burns his face and the fire burns his head. He makes it out of the building and gives the child in the blanket into the arms of a mother who's weeping with joy at this point and they proceed to take him to the hospital if we move forward many years later we find another cold winter's night with a homeless man hungry cold and struggling to walk along the streets finds himself in a neighborhood much like the one I just described and comes to a house much like the one I just described and sees that there's a commotion going on in this house and in a cold morning he thinks to himself well maybe I can take a chance maybe I can go and see if I can get something right at this house and the more he approaches the house the more he sees something's going on until he gets to the front door and he sees that there's a, a party a celebration happening inside of this house at the finest people of society find themselves in this house and they're well dressed and they're eating nicely and everything's warm and everything's fantastic and he's hungry and he's homeless and he's hurting and he's cold and he knocks on the door and the servant chases him away and says to him what do you want here and he says no i just want to he says go to the back door go to the back door and the servant chases him around and he gets to the back door they're standing at the back door he asks the servants just for something warm to eat. It's just something to fill his belly, which has been empty for a few days. And the servant is busy. Afrikaans says it nicely. They're busy telling him how bad he is and how useless he is. And they're about to chase him away from this fancy house where he has no right to be because he doesn't fit in there. He doesn't match the pattern. He doesn't look like those people. And as they're chasing him away, I silhouette of the lady of the house passes the door and she happens to stop at that door to find out what's happening the servants tell her that this unattractive homeless beggar is asking for food and um, she comes closer and says to the servants they can go and she speaks to him she asks him a question she says to him but what has brought you in life to this situation how, how is it that you that you hear how, how is it that you look like you do and you are like you are and you're standing at my door looking for bread why is your life such a mess 
And him looking down, he answers the lady of the house and says, You see, my lady, there was a day when I was still a young man and that I walked past the house that was burning. And hearing the cries of a mother, I ran into that house, not worried, and saved the little girl and brought her downstairs. And you see, when I went into that house, I burnt my hands and I can't really work with my hands anymore. I can't really pick anything up. I burnt my feet so I don't walk that fast. I burnt my face so people don't like to look at me. I burnt my back so I can't really carry anything. I burnt myself badly that day saving that girl and nobody wants to employ me because I can't do much with my hands and with my feet. I can't do much with my back and with my face and nobody likes to look at me. And I struggle to find work and that's why I am in the situation that I am now. And when he looked up he saw the tears running down this young lady's face. She proceeded to grab him and take him into the house and put him on a chair in a room in front of her finest friends in a place he didn't deserve to be because he was so out of... He didn't fit in there. With tears in her eyes, she lifted him on a chair in front of everybody and said, This is the man that saved my life when I was a small girl. She said, Behold the scars upon his hands and the scars upon his feet. Look at the man that saved me when I was small. Looking at everybody, she said to him, You will always have a house because my house is now your house. You will never go without clothes because my clothes is your clothes. You'll never not have food because my food is your food. Everything I have is yours because you gave everything you had to me to save me that day. You see, there was a difference when she looked upon him the first time. He was a stranger. But after he revealed himself to her and she saw the scars on his hands and on his feet, She knew that he he was no longer just a stranger. This was her savior. The one that saved her so very, very long ago. The title of my sermon this morning is that. Behold the man. Take note of him. Behold him. Look at him. Perceive him. Amen. I'd like to read you a bit of scripture out of God's word where this specifically takes place. It's written in the Bible where Jesus has been caught and he's been taken to Pilate. And it says the following. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. It's very easy to read a bit of scripture. That's one sentence. It's very easy just to read that. And Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And a lot of the times when we read the Bible, it's very easy for us to just read and Pilate scourged him. That must have been a good three, four hours where Jesus was tied, naked to a whipping post. And Roman soldiers took turns with a cat of nine tails, which is a whip that's got pieces of leather on it and little bits of bone and steel and, 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 and wood and hard things on the edge of it. So that when you whip somebody with it, those things stick in the flesh. And when you pull back, it rips ribbons of flesh off the back. And it pulls pieces of meat off the back. It's easy to read there. So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. But if you just stop at that sentence and don't read any further and think about what that means... It means that for four or five hours they beat him and ripped pieces of flesh off of him. Amen. Let's go further. I know it's rough to think about it, but you have to think about it. Because I want you to behold Jesus this morning. You know, there's a very big difference between hearing about Jesus and having a heart relationship with Jesus. There's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that have heard about Jesus, but they don't know him. In close, intimate, personal relationship. I want to say to you this morning, it's not good enough for you to hear about Jesus from me. I want to ask you, do you know Him? There was a night this week, and I know it's going to sound strange, and sometimes people don't believe these certain things, but there was a night this week that I woke up and Jesus was standing in my room. I didn't see Him. Didn't see His physical body, but I perceived His presence standing in my room. His peace, His love, His joy. I could even feel he's he's standing around about there. (laughs) I don't know how to explain it to you. I couldn't see him. But I knew he was there. I knew Jesus was in our room. I told Maria, Jesus was in our room this week. Didn't see him, but he was standing there. You know how I know he was there? Because there was a time I didn't know him and he was just a stranger to me, but he revealed himself to me. And after he revealed himself to me and I tasted the sweetness of his presence for the first time, I began I became thirsty for more of that presence. And I've drunk of his presence once and I just want to drink of it more. So I chase after him because I want more of what he gave me that first time I met him. And the more I chase him, the more he introduces himself to me. And the more I know him. 
That now I know when His presence comes into the church. I will know the difference between Him and a lying spirit or a demonic thing trying to pretend to be Jesus. Because I know Jesus for myself. There's a very big difference between hearing about Jesus and knowing Him for yourself. And listen this morning, it makes all the difference in the world. Do you know how you stay serving God after all the years of being on the road and, and the bumps and the uphills and the downhills and the difficulties? You know how you continue to serve Jesus, not by only having heard about Him, but by knowing Him. Because once you know Him, you love Him. And you want to serve Him and you want to walk with Him. And even when it gets very difficult, then what happens? Then it's not just the Jesus I've heard about, it's the Jesus I know. And that I walk with and that I speak to and that I call out to when things get difficult. Amen? I don't want to serve a Jesus of my own making. I don't want to serve a Jesus that I, I make up in my mind to be a certain way. I want to serve Jesus as He is. As He has revealed Himself to me and as He has opened Himself to me in His Word. Do you want to know who Jesus is? Read the Bible. Because He is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. If you want to know Jesus, read more of the Bible. Amen. Listen to what the Scripture says. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. After he's whipped, his tormenting doesn't stop. For a good two, three hours they must have whipped him. Because those Romans, they didn't play games. They were vicious people. And they didn't treat him as a friend. They treated him as an enemy. After this, after he's bleeding and ripped. Strip, strips of flesh have been pulled off his back then they put the crown of thorns on his head then they hit him with a reed then they spit upon him then they slapped him with his hands then they mocked him hail king of the Jews Amen Pilate then went out again and said to them this is the Jewish people so Jesus is brought out in front of the Jewish people wearing a purple robe with a crown of thorns on his head he brings him out and says behold I am bringing him out to you that you, that you might know that I find no fault in him then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to, him, to them, the Jewish people, Behold the man. Look at him. In other words, look at what we've just done to him. Look at how he's bleeding. But also look how they've dressed him. They've dressed him as a king. Behold the man. Look at him. Stop not looking at him. Look at him. Behold the man. Therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him. They cried out saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. Amen. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid, and he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, you have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. I'm here because the Father determined me to be here. That's what Jesus was saying. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate again sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Amen. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place which called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, exactly at the same time that the Passover lamb was being taken and being slaughtered, exactly the same time that Jesus was about to be crucified. And the Jews said, Behold, and, 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 and he said to the Jews again, now listen to what he says. First time he says, Behold the man. Second time he says, Behold your king. Amen. Behold your king. But they cried away with him. Crucify him. Pilate says to them again. Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered. We have no king but Caesar. This is Jewish people saying that. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And they crucified him. And Pilate put a sign on the top of the cross above Jesus' head, saying, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It's very important for you and for me not to have a Jesus that fits into a pattern that we've made, but to have the Jesus according to the way He is. This was the problem that the Jewish people had. Sister Ron and I spoke about it recently. When Jesus first came, the Jewish people were looking for the Lion of Judah. 
But when he first came, he came as the Lamb of God. Do you know that the Jewish people right now are still looking for the Lion of Judah? They have not seen the Lamb of God. They were looking for a king to come in the flesh and to in the physical rule and reign and take all the enemies of Israel and put them under his feet and under their feet. He was supposed to rule in strength. That's what the Jewish people were waiting for. And when Jesus came, they missed him. You know why? Because he didn't fit the pattern of what they were expecting. They were expecting the conquering hero. They weren't expecting the humble, spotless Lamb of God who came to be a servant and not to be served. Who came to die and not to rule and reign. He came to lay His life down. And because they had an idea of what they were expecting from the Messiah, they missed Him. And do you know that they willfully missed Him? They chose to miss Him. Three times... Three times, Pilate says, you know, you know what purple means in those days? Only kings wore purple. The first time he brings them out, Jesus is holding a staff like a king. He's wearing a crown. It might have been a crown of thorns like a king. He was wearing purple like a king. And Pilate says, behold the man. And they say, we don't want him. He doesn't fit our pattern. The second time, Pilate says, behold your king. And they say, we don't want him. He doesn't fit our pattern. Amen. When he's crucified, it's written there above their heads. Jesus, the king of the Jews. And they said, take it down. We don't want it written. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. It's done. Amen. They were willfully ignorant. Do you know that the Jewish people chose not to accept Jesus? Because Nicodemus comes in the middle of the night to Jesus. He's a ruler amongst the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, amongst the priests. And you know what he says? We know you are a prophet come from God. He says, we know that you are a prophet come from God. So why did they crucify him? Why? Because he didn't fit their pattern. Look at this. This is amazing to me. A thousand years before Jesus is born. King David writes this. And the Jewish people that crucified Jesus had the scripture in their hands. Listen to what it says. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What does Jesus say on the cross? Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A thousand years before Jesus is born, God takes David by the Holy Spirit and opens up the corridors of time and shows him the crucifixion and shows him Christ. Listen to what it says. Why art thou far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Listen to what it says. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potshot. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And Jesus says, I thirst. And his tongue cleft to the roof of his mouth. Amen. It goes further. Listen to this. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. An assembly of wicked have enclosed me. A thousand years before Jesus is born, he writes, They pierce my hands and my feet. I can see all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. And a thousand years later, Jesus' hands and feet are nailed. His tongue is stuck to the roof of his mouth. He calls out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at the foot of his cross, they're playing dice for his clothes. A thousand years later. Don't tell me the Jewish people didn't know. Because when he was crucified, it fulfilled this scripture. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Look at Isaiah 53, 2 to 5. Look what it speaks about. It speaks to the Jewish people about about the Messiah. It describes the Messiah to them. Listen to what it says. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to Him. Nothing in His appearance that we should desire Him. Listen to what it says. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. That doesn't say He was going to come as a king and rule in a palace and all were going to worship Him. It said He was going to be rejected by all mankind. We were going to consider Him stricken of God and He was going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Amen? That's describing the Messiah. Like one from whom the people hid their face. We don't want Him. 
He doesn't fit our pattern. Crucify Him. That's what the Jewish people said. He was despised and we held Him in low esteem. Listen to what it said. Surely He took our pain and bore our suffering. Yes, we con- yet we considered Him punished by God, stricken by Him and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him and Old King James, by his stripes, we are healed. Because they took the strips off his back. And the Jewish people chose not to accept him. Because he didn't fit their pattern. Right now, you and I in the Christian church needs a new revelation of who Jesus is. At this point in time, we need it more now than ever before. If you will have a new revelation of Jesus, if the Christian church has a new revelation of Jesus Christ, the Christian church will not be led astray by false prophets and false preachers and false teachers doing silly, stupid things to the weakest people in our congregation. People won't get led astray because they'll have a revelation of who Jesus is. Amen? Do you know when they whipped him, it, it must have been something terrible. It's so easy for us to read and they took him out to the place of the skull and there they crucified him. And It's easy to read it, but you've got to think about it. You know how somebody was crucified? They were stretched. Sometimes this shoulder was pulled out of joint just to make it reach to where the nails were. You were pierced in your hands, your feet were crossed together and a nail, the long one, was driven between both feet. Imagine the bridge of your feet having a nail pushed through there. And then you hang. And what happens, a crucifixion takes a long time. Because first you hang, and then you stretch like this, and your ribs are pulled. And it's hard to breathe, and you can't breathe. So what happens, you push up on your feet, those feet that have nails to them. You push up, so that you can breathe again. So now you're pushing on the nails on your feet. Now it's painful on your feet. Now eventually your feet can't handle it anymore, so you drop again. And you sit there, now your feet are feeling a little bit better, but now your hands are being pulled, and everything's going out of joint, and you can't breathe again. (laughs) And then you push up on your feet again. That's what happened with Jesus. And a man on a cross will spend days pushing up and down. and Because nobody wants to die, you spend days pushing up and down. Till eventually you can't anymore. And there's no more strength in you, so you hang. And then you suffocate, and the water fills your lungs, and your heart becomes weak, and you die of heart for suck, and your, your heart just collapses in on itself. Most people died on the cross like that. Jesus didn't have time to die like that because they'd already beaten him so badly. And he'd poured out his blood all the way from Pilate's whipping post when he carried his cross to the top of that hill. When they crucified him, he was almost dead already. Why was he thirsty so much that his tongue stuck to his roof? Because almost all of his blood had already been poured out. That's why when they said it's the high feast, break their knees so that they can die quickly. Why did they break the knees? Because once the knees are breaking, the pushing up and down stops. Because you can't push up and down on broken knees. That's what they would do. They would break the knees so the person dies quicker on the cross. By the time they came to Jesus, they were amazed that he was already dead. They said, we don't have to break his knees. So that the scripture might be fulfilled. A spotless male without spot and blemish, without broken bone, sacrificed for us. Amen. You need to understand how much Jesus suffered for you and me on the cross. Do you know that the Bible says he did not look like a man? When they crucified him, he looked, like, he looked like meat in the form of a man. You know why I'm saying this to you? Because if you will behold him and what he went through for you, you will never become lukewarm again in your life. You know why we don't get through in worship? Because we don't behold him. Do you want the anointing to come upon you? You know the anointing. You know how it feels. It feels nice, right? Have you ever been in a service where it seems like it's struggling and the people not getting into the anointing? You know what you must do? Forget everybody else. Close your eyes and remember the spotless Lamb of God that was crucified for you. Cast your eyes and heart and mind back to Calvary. Look upon the cross and look upon Jesus. Look upon what they did to Him. If you'll do that while you sing, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will just drop upon you. Because the Holy Spirit does not testify about Himself, but He testifies about Jesus always. You know why we don't come through in prayer? Why we can offer empty, cold, stale prayers because we're praying without our hearts fixed upon Jesus. 
If you will worship that the fire falls, think about Jesus on the cross. If you will pray that your room gets shaken and your kids are too scared to make a noise, think about Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. If you want to live a life that's on fire for God, keep your heart upon Jesus. You know what the Bible says? I would that you were hot and I would that you were cold, but because you've become lukewarm, that's the Bible, not me, the Bible says I will spit you out of my mouth. God says, I would that you were hot and I would that you were cold, but because you've become lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You know what cold is? God can reveal himself to cold and cold gets on fire and God can do something with cold. God can obviously do something with hot because it's already in the stream. You know why God can't do anything with lukewarm? You know why? Because lukewarm has heard everything already. Lukewarm knows everything already. Lukewarm has gotten its heart and its eyes off of the crucified son of God and thought about everything he suffered. You know when he was crucified to that cross... My sins pushed the nails through his hands and through his feet. Have you ever thought about that? My sins whipped him. Because his body had to be broken for the punishment of my sins. His blood was poured out for the forgiveness of them. My sins whipped him. My sins mocked him. My sins spat upon him. My my sins whipped him. My sins hit him. My sins put him there. My willful acts did that to the Son of God. Do you know that? My sins did it. Amen? And I've got to think about that. And when I think about that, I look at Jesus. And then my heart is on fire. Lord, I want to love you. I want to serve you. I want to be a child of God for you. You know how you get lukewarm? Ah, I've heard about the cross before. I know about the anointing. Listen, I've been serving God for the last 40 years, my brother. There's nothing you can tell me about the Bible. Lukewarm has heard it all. Lukewarm has seen it all. Lukewarm knows it all. And lukewarm you can do nothing with because lukewarm knows it all and has heard it all. And that's why God says, I'd rather have you hot or cold. But because you become lukewarm and you think you know everything, there's going to come a time I'm going to spit you out my mouth as profane. Because the anointing will move in the church and you won't step forward because you think you know it all. You've heard about Jesus. And that's why I'm saying it's not good enough for you to have heard about Jesus. You must know Him for yourself. You must know Jesus for yourself. They missed Him. It's like that man that came to stand at the door and the servants wanted to chase Him away. Come on, the servants of Satan in your life will always try and chase Christ away from your door. I'm not saying any of you have servants of Satan in your life, but I'm saying there's things that would like to chase Christ out of your life. There's habits, there's TV programs, those those things want to just chase Christ away. Before you can get a proper look at Him. What happened if that lady walking past the door hadn't come past at that moment? The servants would have chased Him away and she would have never known Him. But once she got speaking to Him and He revealed the reasons why, what did she do? That's the thing that you and I need to do. Grab hold of Jesus. Behold Him. Don't just know Him and look at Him from your door. I know about Jesus. But get hold of Him. Behold Him. And take Him into your house. Because He who gave you everything, give Him everything. Lord, this is your house now. Because on that cross you laid down all that you had to give yourself to me. And I'll know Him by the nail prints in His hands. Amen. They missed Him. They missed Him. Because they were looking for a different pattern. They missed Him. Amen. Do you know that the Jesus we serve now, He was crucified. And I need to get that in my heart. He did die. And the stone was rolled away. And I've got to get that into my heart. Do you understand? He suffered so that I don't have to suffer. Do you understand? He was forsaken so that I don't have to be forsaken. Do you know that He was hated so that I can be loved? Do you know that He was cast away so that I can be brought in? Do you know that He was pushed into darkness so that I can get into the glorious light of God? Do you know that on the cross He called out to the Father, My God, why hast Thou forsaken me? That I can say this morning, Your word says, Lord, Thou shalt never leave me nor forsake me. He became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He died so that I can have life and life everlasting. He laid everything down so that I can pick it up for myself. Because if He didn't do it, I'd be lost and separated from God forever. He did die. But on the third day, 
that stone was rolled away. And he did rise again from the dead. And he was seen of many witnesses. Amen. And he did ascend into heaven. Amen. And he is coming back again in power and in glory. I want to explain something so that Christians don't miss it. The Jewish people missed it because Jesus didn't fit the pattern of what they had in their mind. They were looking for the lion when the lamb came. They're still looking for the lion. But the Bible says that just before the end, they shall be converted. They're going to come back. The Jewish nation are going to have the lamb revealed to them. Isaiah is going to go open to them. The law is not going to hang in front of their faces like a veil, like Moses. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the glorious light of the gospel is hidden from the Jewish people at this point in time. In the same way that the veil is hidden, the veil was in front of Moses' face. In the reading of the law, the veil is still upon their eyes. And they do not see Christ yet. But the Bible says there's coming a time when that veil shall be removed. And then Isaiah is going to go open to them. And Psalms 22 is going to go open to them. And if the excluding of them is glorious to us, how much more will the including of them be again more glorious? Because we're the wild olive branch that's been engraved into the true vine. Amen. The true vine bears us, we not it. Amen. And we engrafted there. Praise God. And I thank Him that I'm engrafted there. But children of God must not get the idea that Jesus Christ is coming back as the Lamb of God. Right now, you must accept Him and know Him as the Lamb of God. Because you come to Him as the Lamb of God in salvation. But once you've come to Him as the Lamb of God in salvation, and His blood has purged you from all sin and iniquity, you know who you receive then. You receive Him as He is now. And as He is now, is the Lion of Judah that has broken every chain of darkness. There are children of God that think that He is only gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Listen, I love gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Because without his love and long-suffering and patience, he would have gotten finished with me long time ago. And I love that when I come to his blood, he only treats me as Jesus Christ, meek and mild and gentle and love him. When I'm his child and by his blood, that's the only way he treats me. He treats me with grace and love and as a father. And a father does correct the son, but it's always in love and in mercy. But if I don't come to him through his blood as the lamb, you know what I have? I have the Lion of Judah to deal with only. And you know what the Bible says? That in the last days the Father shall tread out the winepress of His wrath. You know why? Because when Jesus was crucified, just like wine is taken and grapes are put there and the grapes are crushed, that's what happened to Jesus for you and me. He was crushed and His blood was poured out so that we can be saved and a door of grace can be opened, that we can enter into the love of the Father. But the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last days. That at a moment, the Hasir, the father of the house, will stand up. And in the days of Noah, the door was closed. And those that were outside were outside. And those that were inside were inside. And when the rain fell, nobody could open the door because God closed the ark. And only those souls were saved inside the ark. In the last days, it will be the same. God is going to stand up and close the door of grace. And when it's closed, you're inside with Jesus. Or you're outside in the wrath of God. Because he said, I gave you time to come. I called you in a day acceptable. And I said, come unto me. Come have peace. Come have mercy. Come have love. Come to the Lamb of God so that you can be saved. But there's coming a day when the Lamb of God's door will close. And my name will be written in the Lamb's book of life with the blood of Jesus. Or it will not be. And if I'm not there, then it's the Lion of Judah that shall judge. Listen, we are not going to get away with anything. I can hide things from you. And I can smile and I can be away and I can hide it. And I can be good at hiding it. And nobody can know what I'm busy with. And they can think I'm like this. But actually I'm busy with other stuff here. But I want to tell you something. You will not hide it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are people that think when Jesus comes back he's going to be the gentle Jesus. The Lamb of God. And as he comes back, they're going to have time to come to him and say, I'm sorry, I know you're peaceful, I know you're loving, I know you're gentle, Jesus. If the door's closed, it's closed, and you're not dealing with the lamb anymore. You're dealing with the lion of Judah. Listen, when Jesus became flesh, and he was born in the virgin Mary's womb, and the Holy Spirit created him there, when he became flesh, he laid down his godly power and authority and omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience. He laid down the power of God to become flesh he who made everything and everything was made in him by him through him for him condensed himself into flesh 
into the womb of the Virgin Mary and emptied himself of his godliness. Jesus walked as a man and did everything he did under the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he did no miracles before, before he first went to the Jordan. And when he went to the Jordan and was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him as a dove. And the Holy Spirit drove him into the desert. And there he was tempted. But the Bible says, who is this coming out of the wilderness? Smelling like aloe and myrrh. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? And Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a man, by the power of the Holy Spirit, did the miracles that we saw him do. He didn't do it as God. He did it as a man, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, following... He said, I don't do anything by myself. What I hear the Father tell me to do, I do. What I see the Father tell me to do, I do. I don't do this by myself. And it was the Holy Spirit through him doing it. But listen, when he ascended on high... And he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He sat down on the right hand of the throne of God Almighty and took back everything that was his. He took back all authority, all power, all dominion. He took back all the power he had with God before as God. Amen? Listen, John, that wrote the book of John, used to lie against Jesus' breast. He was the disciple that was closest to Jesus. All the others could have done it. They just never dared do it. He was such a close friend. He used to lie against Jesus like this. Okay? But when Jesus comes to John on the Isle of Patmos, listen to what it says. This is John saying, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with garments down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass, as if burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance, his appearance, was like the sun that shines in his strength. And John, that used to lie against Jesus' breast, said, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead person. I believe he died. When John turned around to see the one he knew in the flesh, he didn't turn around to see the one that was in the flesh. He turned around to see God who took back all his power and authority. That was no more the baby in the manger, no more the Savior on the cross, no more the body in the tomb. This was the risen Lion of Judah. And when John turned around to look at the one he knew in his life, that wasn't the same Jesus anymore. That wasn't the Lamb, that was the Lion. And when he looked at him, he fell down dead. (laughs) He looked at him and dropped. Amen. And he said, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that was dead and is alive forevermore. And has given to me all power and authority and dominion. I believe with all my heart John died. And Jesus put his right hand on him and he rose him from the dead again. Amen. I don't serve a baby in the manger. Yes, I've got to cast my heart back to Calvary. I've got to look upon what they did to my Jesus. That I never become lukewarm, but I always stay on fire for Him. But I don't serve a baby in the manger. I serve the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I come to Him as the Lamb of God, and He's gentle and He's peaceable with me. But I'm not going to get away with anything. Because those eyes of fire, the Bible says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That we shall give an account of the things we've done in the flesh. I'm going to stand before Jesus one day. Not to be judged for sin, but to be judged for what I did in this life. I'm not going to get away with anything. I'm not going to get away with preaching here and being a two-faced and not living it and doing it myself. You know why? Because I can fool you all, all of the time, but I will not fool Jesus, not once. Because He knows me inside and out. And one day I'll stand in front of those eyes of fire and He will look upon me. You know what the Bible says? Every man's work shall be tried as with fire. The day shall declare it, whether wood or hay or stubble or precious stones and gold and silver. The fire of Jesus Christ is going to fall upon the ministry that I present to you. Because I know he has said to me, I shall stand accountable for your souls one day. I stand accountable for you, hey? If I didn't preach you the gospel, if I try to make things nice and and peaceable for you because I don't want to hurt your feelings. Or did I tell you the truth? You will not get away with anything. If you do sin, the wages of sin is death. But come to Christ, for the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. If you'll submit yourself to Him, repent of your sins, and serve Him, He'll carry you through this life. I promise you. Because the Lamb died for me, but the Lion also fights for me. 
The lamb laid his life down for me, but the lion stands for me. Amen. Sometimes I've just got to let the lion grow, growl out of me. Let him fight my battles for me. Let him defend me. He's never lost one battle. Even on the cross, the lamb never lost the battle. Listen, beware the lamb of God. Beware the lion of Judah. I don't want to play with the grace of God. He loved me so much that he died for me. He loved me so much that he rose again from the dead for me. He loves me so much that he ascended into heaven for me. And he loves me so much, and you this morning so much, that he says, I go away to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming back to take you to be with me where I am. And if it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you that. Amen? But you and I need to have the right appearance and the right understanding of who it is that we have to deal with. We have to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, the Lily of the Valley, the Rose of Sharon. But we also have to deal with the Lion of Judah. Listen, when Jesus comes back again, and the Bible says the eastern sky shall split open, and He shall set His foot on the Mount of Olives. It's not the Lamb that sets His foot on the Mount of Olives, it's the Lion of Judah. You know what the Bible says? When He puts His foot on the Mount of Olives, it shall split in two. It's going to separate. When Jesus walks in the east gate, and that gate bursts open in front of him, the Bible says he's going to rule and reign. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. It's not going to be the Lamb. And that's what's presented before us. I don't want you to have a wrong perception of Jesus. I don't want you to have a Jesus of your own making. I don't want you just to hear about Jesus. I want you to know him. When he knocks on your door, open wide the chambers of your life when he searches your heart don't say Lord you can't look in that door because there's still some things I like to do in that door throw open all the doors Lord search me to the depth of myself throw open every chamber of my heart soul and life let thy light shine in there if there's any cockroaches let them run out let your Holy Spirit sweep clean have my life Lord have all of myself because on that cross you gave all for me you gave everything for... I don't want to miss you like the Jewish people did because they had an idea of who Jesus was. He loved me so much. I don't deserve it. I don't want to play with Him. For He is God. I'm not going to get away with anything. I'm not saying come reveal yourself in front of people. I'm saying to you from here, be honest with Him. Don't hide anything from Him. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, just bring it to the foot of Christ's cross. Say, Lord, by your precious blood, I bring this attitude of mine. By your precious blood at the foot of your cross, I bring this temper of mine. Lord, I bring the swear words that sometimes pop out, I bring it to you, yeah. Because right now, I'm dealing with a lamb. But later, I'm not going to deal with the lamb anymore. I'm going to deal with him who judges righteously. And I don't want to be outside the door. And, and and, and we can't play in the door today and out the door tomorrow, in the door today and out the door tomorrow, serving God today and not serving God tomorrow. We can't do that. Because what happens if I'm here when the door's closed? The door's closed, it's closed. Serve Him with all your heart, soul, life. Perceive Him. Behold the man. Behold the man. Look at the hands that were pierced for you. Look at the feet that were pierced for you. Look at his brow upon which the crown of thorns was placed. Look at his back where the skin was pulled off so that you might be healed. Look at his side where they pushed the spear in so that the last drops of blood could be poured out. Because the heart holds blood. Do you know that means that Jesus gave everything? He gave his last drops of blood. They pierced the heart so that the last could come out. When he had given his all and could give more, the Father made them pierced so that the rest could come out. He laid everything down. Behold Him. And hear this morning the echoings of a song. How can I make a lesser sacrifice when my Jesus gave His all? I want to give Him everything this morning. And even now I know that in myself there's maybe still parts that are holding back. All I can say is, Lord, come take those parts that are holding back. 
they are being stubborn <laughs> give them to you Lord help me just to surrender it to you I'd like to sing this song just before I do the Nachmal let's sing it together please behold the man standing somewhere Stand for me. He is the only one who cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the, the shadows, you will find me. betrayed he took the bread and he gave thanks he said this is my body which is broken for you he said take and eat and do this as often as you will in remembrance of me and I believe we need to do this often we need to behold Jesus often the Bible says in the book of Acts they went from house to house often breaking bread and remembering Jesus often we need to do this often I need to remember he was broken for me often. He was pierced for me. I need to remember it often. That same night he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The cup of my blood which is shed for the remission of the sins of many. Take and drink. As often as you do this, you declare my death until my return. Amen. Behold Jesus, do it often. I ask you to please come forward, partake in the Holy Communion as we still sing the song. Thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that was poured out. Jesus, let us behold you. Let us perceive you. Let us see you in our hearts and in our minds. That we'd never become lukewarm, but always remain on fire for you. Do we thank you for it in Jesus' name? Thank you, Lord. You may come forward as well. And you'll know him by the nail prints in his